have your Bible tonight and will turn with us to the last book of the Old Testament, the little prophecy of Malachi. I'm not going to read because I will be referring to several of the scriptures that are here. Our subject tonight is God's question and man's answer. And we have in this prophecy here eight charges or accusations that God brought against his people. It can all be summed up in the one question which he asks them. It's found in the third chapter, verse 8, Will a man rob God? That's an awful charge to make, but God made it. He says, Will a man rob God? And before they could answer, God answered and said, Ye have robbed me. And then they learned a trick of the trade, and they came back with a contemptuous question themselves. Wherein have we robbed you? And you'll find that that is the method the, in the entire book of these eight charges that were brought. Now, Malachi brings down the curtain on the drama of God and man. His was the last voice that was heard, and then there followed four centuries of silence, and then another voice crying in the wilderness, an Old Testament voice, John the Baptist speaking to the people. But Malachi is the one who gave the final word and afterward there was that long and painful silence. Now, the last voice was in the nature of a quiz program, as God puts these charges to his people. And in order to understand the questions and the answers, we need to interpret the questions in the light and understanding of that generation who at that time attempted to answer by asking a question in turn. They had spent 70 years in captivity, and only a remnant of them had returned to the land. Reluctantly and half-heartedly, they set about restoring the cities and rebuilding the temple. They had to be urged on, as we saw in Haggai and Zechariah, it took both of these men urging them, and on the sideline was a man like Ezra and Nehemiah, helping and leading the people at this time. These folk had known the rigors and the suffering of slavery. Like their fathers in the brickyards in Egypt, they knew what it was to groan under the taskmaster's lash. They knew what it was to suffer as slaves. And like their fathers, therefore, they groaned quite loudly. But on returning, they endured hardships in the land. Severe persecutions came to them, and they were discouraged. And yet these were God's methods to discipline them. It was a form of correction on his part. He needed to do this in order that he might get the dross out of the pure metal. But it did not have the desired effect. You know, the discipline of God will either soften you or harden you. We had a striking example of that on our radio program of two letters I read on Friday. I'm sure some of you heard the program. I have a letter from a family. They're out in the San Fernando Valley. They are bitter. They have been called to go through a great ordeal. It's true. But they ask for prayer, and we put their name on the prayer list. Their first charge to me was that I didn't even turn the prayer in. Again, they said, we believe the Bible is just fiction. We tried to trust God, and he let us down. My, how bitter they were. But I had another letter, and it's from a little fella down here in the orthopedic hospital. He listens to our program every day. He's 18 years old. He doesn't know what it is to be out of pain. He's in the bed down here, never gets out of the bed, listens to our program, reads the Bible, witnesses to the nurses. And one of them said to me, 
Never have we heard this fellow complain, and he always has a smile on his face. May I say to you, friends, suffering will either drive you from God or it'll drive you to God. It'll do one of the two. You'll never be the same after you've been through an ordeal that God puts you through. And he permits these things to come to us because of that. Now, these people were being disciplined of God, and it actually was driving them farther and farther away from God. Actually, they became as hard as nails. They were like an inmate that had been in a prison. They were released, but they were not reformed at all. And so now God moves in on them. There wasn't much more God could do for them. He had actually exhausted his infinite arsenal of correction in dealing with them. And it was out of the soil of this generation that there grew those poisonous plants that appeared in our Lord's day, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. They came out of this particular period, if you please. What was a pimple on the surface broke out later on as a raging cancer. What was a scratch just on the surface of the nation became an internal leprosy, if you please. And God tried to stem the spread of the virus. He attempted to cauterize it. And he made these eight specific charges that burned into their souls. Now, they denied each charge. We'll not look at all of them tonight, but you'll find that with each one of them, they express surprise that God would even question them. They act like a rebellious teenager when you approach them on some question. They affected an injured innocence. Why, they didn't know what God was talking about to begin with. With a wave of the hand, they dismissed his questions and his charge. And with a shrug of the shoulder, they told him to go on and mind his own business. And they said, in fact, we just can't be bothered. Now, will you notice some of these charges that God brought to them and some of the answers that they gave. The book opens like a love story. In one sense, that's what it is. He says here, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord. That's the way he opens. Isn't that a wonderful way to open? I have loved you, saith the Lord. Listen to them. Here's their answer now. Yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? They with a sneer, as it were, with a very flip answer. You say you love us? (laughs) Wherein do you love us? They doubted the love of God. The very interesting thing is that that's exactly where man went off at the very beginning. The Old Testament opens with man doubting the love of God. It closes with man doubting the love of God. And fundamentally, that's the problem of most of us right here tonight. We actually doubt the love of God, don't we? When that test comes and darkness comes and we're faced up with the problem, our question is, why does God let this happen to me? He really doesn't love me, does he? They doubted the love of God. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Wherein hast thou loved us? God has the answer. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. I'll not read on. God had proof. They said to him, Wherein have you loved us? God says, I love Jacob, and I've loved those seed that have come from him in spite of their sin. I've loved them, and I can demonstrate it. And the demonstration was this. You have returned from captivity. Your back is a nation. Where is Edom? 
Because at the time of the captivity, 70 years before, Edom stood on the sidelines and laughed. In fact, they cheered the Babylonians on and actually aided them by encouraging them. But they were yonder in that Rocky Mountain fast, and you remember we saw in the little prophecy of Obadiah, God says, though you exalt yourself to the skies, like the eagles, God says, I'll bring you down. And in that 70 years, God brought them down. They are now a scattered people. They said they would return. They did not return. And up to tonight, Edom has never returned. God says, I've loved you, Jacob. And the proof is, I have brought you back into the land. God had proof. And yet they, in a very contemptuous way, wherein have you loved us? My beloved, it's easy for us to point the finger back yonder, but I wonder tonight how many of us as believers today are not giving a wrong testimony to the world today as believers. Are you telling anyone that God loves you? Does the world around you know tonight that God really loves you? The psalmist says, the Lord is good. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of his enemy. And my friend, if you don't say so, I can guarantee you one thing, and I say this very carefully. The politicians won't say it tomorrow. And when you look at the news tomorrow night on TV, you're going to hear all sorts of politics, and I'm no prophet to say that. You know it'll be there. It's warming up. Not one of them is going to say that the Lord is good. The only one that will say that the Lord is good will be a child of God. I wonder if we are saying that. Are we today casting some doubt in our own hearts and minds? Wherein have you loved us? And that was the answer that these people were giving. They doubted, first of all, the love of God. And God had the proof. God says, where is Edom? They have not returned, and they'll never return. But you have returned, and I'll never let you go. And isn't it interesting? We can move down now just about 2,500 years to where we are tonight, and Israel's back in the land. But where is Edom? God says, I have proof that I love you. And then tonight... Look at your own heart and life. Do you doubt the love of God? Well, look. Will you look at this for just a minute? You want proof that God loves you? He brought you right up to where you are right now. And he did it because he loved you. Do you doubt it? Have you got any complaint to make tonight? God has brought you up to this moment. And he's been good to you. You look about you today and see whether he's been good to you or not. I can point to you tonight and to multitudes of people that are not in the favored position that most of you folk are in tonight. God has demonstrated his love to you and me tonight. The Lord's good. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And not say, wherein hast thou loved us? That's what these people were saying. Now, that's not the only one. God moves on. And here in verse 6, will you listen to him again? He says, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? Now, God says to these people, his people, he says now in the world, We've had Mother's Day today, and a great many folk have honored their mother. And I think that's quite proper, by the way. A great many people think that this is becoming a sort of a mom idea that becomes worship. I don't think so. I think it's a very noble thing to remember your mother on Mother's Day. Nothing wrong with that in and of itself. And the Lord says, In the natural realm, a father receives honor. And if a man is a master... His servant always says to him, Yes, sir, what will you have me to do? But God says, this is his question. 
He says, where is my honor? Now, the danger today in Mother's Day is that we give more attention to Mother than we do to God. The danger today is that we give more attention to our master down here, and there's some men down here who pay more attention to their boss than they'll pay to God. They are more obedient to some man down here or some woman down here than they are to God. Listen to God. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If I then be a father, where's mine honor? And if I be a master, where's my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name. Now will you listen? Here is the way they come back. They come back with that little contemptuous question. And ye say, Wherein have we despised thy name? You say we've despised your name. How have we despised your name? Well, God's name stands for all that God is. The writer to the Proverbs says in Proverbs 18.10, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it and are safe. And the Lord Jesus has been given a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee must bow and every tongue must confess. And then we sing a song, Precious name, oh how sweet. The name of God means all that God is. Do you despise the name of God? Do you ever take God's name in vain? And you can hear it today on every hand. When I was a student in seminary, one of the students there was from Davidson College. Davidson College is a very fine school. One day in the post office, he was telling me the year he graduated, one young fellow was sitting in the post office on a box, and he was cursing, taking God's name in vain. One of the fellows, he was a ministerial student, he was on the football team, and he was a senior. He came up to this fellow and he says, look, he says, what kind of mother did you have? And the fellow said, I had a good mother. He says, well, then I think you had a very sorry mother. If she didn't teach you, that's wrong. And if she did teach you, that's wrong. You're a very sorry son. And the fellow turned on his heels and walked out. May I say to you, how many of us today defend the name of God in this godless world in which we are living today? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Wherein have we despised thy name? And that's what a great many folk would say to God tonight. You don't mean we're despising your name. We go to church every Sunday. Yes, but you spend six days during the week despising the name of God. May I say to you that this gets very personal, does it not? But God's not through with him. Will you listen to the, him? He's going to answer him on that. Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and ye say, Wherein have we polluted thee? My, aren't they a honorary crowd? They always come back with this little absurd question, Wherein have we polluted thee? And then he says, In that ye say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. And the answer to that one, and God now asks this question, And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto the governor. Will he be pleased with thee, or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? And I want to tell you, God really has a question for them they can't answer. And here it is. God says you're offering polluted bread on mine altar. They say, wherein are we offering polluted bread? He says, I'll tell you how you're offering polluted bread on mine altar. It's this way. God said that when you bring a sacrifice to me, I want you to offer a male, whether it's a ram, whether it's of the flock, a sheep, 
or whether it is a goat, I want it to be the firstborn. I want it to be the very best. I want you to even keep it up for 14 days to see that it has no blemish. When you offer anything to me, it's to speak of Christ, and it must be the very best. That's what God said to them. All right, in time, this is the thing that happened. They began to offer a sick cow to God. This is the way that it happened. A man had some cattle. He had a very fine registered bull, a ram. And one day the priest says, why don't you offer that to God? And he says, why, well, no, that's my, my prized stock. I would never offer that to God. But a week later, his son comes in. He says, Dad, the old bull is down in the back pasture, and he's down. The father rushes down, takes a look at it, and he's really a sick cow. He says, well, let's get him in the truck and get him up to the temple as quickly as we can, and we'll offer him to God. And that's what they did. And they brought the old sick cow up. And as they went by, people says, Ma, isn't Brother Abraham getting generous? He's given his best stock to God. The rascal, he wasn't. It was a sick cow he was offering to God. And it was brought in. Now God puts them right on the spot. He said, uh, I'd like for you to take that old sick cow down and try to pay your taxes with it and see what happens. Offer it to the governor, see what he says. My beloved, what do you really give God? Does he get as much as the grocer? Does he get as much as the druggist or the doctor? Actually, what do you give God? You see, this hurts. A great many of us say, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were present, far too small. And then we put a dime in the collection plate when it comes by. May I say to you, my friend, that God sees that. And God says that's polluted. I don't take it. You remember when the sons of Arano, they heard David wanted the threshing flow. And by the way, that's where the temple was built. They said to David, David, you're the king. We want to give you this field. David said, no, I'm sorry. You can't give it to me. I never offer to God anything that doesn't cost me something. God said, David says, when I make an offering to God, it's got blood on it. It has to cost me something. But this crowd, no. They were bringing the sick cows. They were bringing the scrub stock. They were bringing that which no one else would have, and they were offering that to God. And that's one reason today that I've quit asking for secondhand clothing. I'm not asking for secondhand clothing for anything anymore because I found out a great many people think they're given to God when they give something secondhand. I don't think God's taking anything secondhand, my beloved, if you really want to know the truth. And it's all right. Don't misunderstand me. It's all right to give secondhand things, but please don't think you're given to God. That's just something that you do on your own. It's not between you and the Lord at all. We ought to get away from this idea today that God today is going to take the second hand and the cast-offs and that which is left. I remember hearing Billy Sunday. I don't remember many things he said because I heard him as a boy. But the few things that he said that I do recall have been burned into my mind, and one of them was this. He said, I was riding west on the train with Mr. Wrigley, the old gentleman that founded the Wrigley Chewing Gum Company. He was a wonderful Christian. He said this, he said to Billy Sunday, he says, I give God one dollar out of ten, and I take God's dollar off of the top. He gets his first. Always put him first. And that's the way God blessed that man. Hines of the Hines, 57 varieties, said the same thing. He said, I've always put God first 
in my business and in my life. And God honors that. And you find here that God is saying to these people that they are beginning to put these other things first. Now let's move on, because I'm sure that this gets rather personal as we move on down. And I'd like to come to this one that we mentioned at the beginning, and this will be our final one. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances, ye have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Now, this seems, actually, this seems to be a criticism that was not justified. Had you been in Jerusalem at the time of Malachi, you would have found that the temple was filled at every one of the times of sacrifices, the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. And on the Sabbath day, the entire area was crowded. We know from profane history that was true. And you might want to join the people and say, well, what in the world is God talking about? He seems to be getting difficult to get along with. The people are crowding into his temple, and yet he says to them, return unto me, and I'll return unto you. What does he mean by that? Well, he means simply this, that they were there in body, but they were not there in spirit. He meant that they had come to go through a ritual, but their heart was far from him. And that's the charge that he makes. And that's the reason he moves in on this particular thing. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? And he puts it right on the line in tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, what's God trying to do? Is God poor and he's trying to get these people to give? No, they belong to him. They were his. He'd redeemed them. In fact, of the matter is, he wanted nothing that they had. And I think today we ought to make that very clear. God is not poor tonight. I think sometimes that I make an appeal that I ought not to make. I feel sometimes very badly after I've made an appeal. I think God would say, McGee, you make it very clear to these people that I'm not poor. I want nothing that they've got. They owe me everything anyway. They belong to me. I'm merely asking them to do something so I can bless them. It all belonged to him. He was not a Shylock of the sky demanding his pound of flesh at all. He created them. They belonged to him. And he tells them that. Listen to this. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. They belong to him. And he said, Someday when I make up my jewels, you will be among them. You belong to me, first of all, because I created you. And you belong to me because I have redeemed you. And tonight God has that same claim on you he has that same claim on me. He created us. He made us. We have been studying in a class here what is known as anthropology, the study of man. As we've looked at the creation of man, it's been quite interesting to note that God created man for this particular climate that we are in. Have you ever noticed that? We can't live very many feet in under the water, and we can't live very many feet up above the air spaces. And I think it's quite interesting that 
that John Glenn can't get rid of these dizzy spells. I think it's interesting that Alan Shepard is having these same dizzy spells now, these men that have been out in space. I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm no doctor. I haven't examined the men. But I'm not sure that God intends man to live anywhere except where he created him. He created us, and he put us here. And if you'll read the Genesis story, you'll find out that everything that God did preliminary to creating man, he was preparing a place to put man. He knew man had to breathe air, and he put air in here, in the air spaces. He knew man had to have something to eat, and he put plant life in here. He knew man had to have a place to live, and he made it very agreeable for man. He did everything for that. God has created us. We belong to him. And my friend, he can take the atmosphere away from us. The very next moment, we'll be absolutely without any air at all. He is our creator. He made us. We belong to him. Instead of demanding a tenth, he could demand everything if he wanted to, but he doesn't. And then he redeemed us, and he paid a tremendous price for our redemption. And let me tell this little story again of the boy that made a boat. He spent all winter making the boat, and his family summered on a lake up in Minnesota. He made the little boat in preparation to go up there. When the summer came, why, he took the boat up with him, and he uh, tied it to a string. And he would let the boat go up and down the lake as he would go in another boat. But one day it got loose, and the wind blew it out, and it disappeared. And the little fellow began to cry, and the time they got the boat, they couldn't find it. And they weren't able to locate it. The little fellow was greatly disturbed, but about a week later he went by a second-hand store in this little town, this little tourist town, and he saw his boat in the wind there. And he went in and he asked the man how much it cost. And the man said, I'll sell it to you for two dollars. The little fellow went home and got his bank. And he opened the bank and got out two dollars. He went down and bought it. And when he got it, he looked at it and he has heard to say, he says, you belong to me now. I made you and I bought you. You're mine. God can say that of you tonight. God made us. We owe everything to him. He doesn't want lip service. He doesn't want us standing afar off. He redeemed us, and he redeemed us that he might bring us to himself. Francis Thompson wrote years ago, he wrote The Hound of Heaven. A great many people always considered that sacrilegious. I never did. I don't think The Hound of Heaven, he meant it for that at all. He depicts God as being the hound of heaven looking for man. My friend tonight, it's not irreverent to say he's on your trail. He made you, and he redeemed you, and he'll be on your trail as long as you're in this life because you're his. He has a right to you, and that's the reason he talked as he did to his people back there, and the reason he talks to us the same way today. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? As we bow our heads tonight in prayer, very briefly, this has been to us a wonderful day here at the Church of the Open Door. But I wonder in the closing moment of this Mother's Day, God made you, but you may be here tonight and he has not yet redeemed you. He died for you. He's made every provision. fact of the matter is, he is the hound of heaven. He's come so close to you tonight, he couldn't get any closer. But he won't come any closer than that. He's come to the door of your heart, and he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I'll come into him. I'll sup with him, he with me. Now, you have to open the door from the inside. He'll not crash the door. But he made you. He's redeemed you, and he stands there tonight asking you one thing, just one thing. Will you open the door and let him in? That's all. Somebody says, but I don't feel worthy. He didn't ask you that. He created you. He redeems you, and he wants to come in. doesn't make any difference who you are. 
He will come in if you'll open the heart's door. 